Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy. These are the news articles chosen for today's discussion. They are given along with the page number of different editions. Link for the handwritten notes in PDF format and the time stamping for the discussed articles are given in the description box as well as the comment section for the benefit of the mobile viewers. Now let us start with the first article. Before discussing the articles, first let us solve some past year questions. Now look at this first question. See this question was asked in the prelims 2019. It is regarding PVTGs, particularly vulnerable tribal groups. There is a reason why I have chosen this question. See recently in our daily news analysis, we have discussed about PVTGs in detail. So use this question as a revision or as a practice regarding the topic of PVTGs. Pause the video for one minute and try to solve this question. I hope aspirants have solved the question. Now let us discuss it. Consider the following statements about particularly vulnerable tribal groups. PVTGs in India. Four statements are given. First statement, PVTGs reside in 18 states and one union territory. Second statement, a stagnant or declining population is one of the criteria for determining PVTG status. Third statement, there are 92 PVTGs officially notified in the country so far. Fourth statement, Urular and Kondaredi tribes are included in the list of PVTGs. Which of the statements given above are correct? Option A, 1, 2 and 3. Option B, 2, 3 and 4. Option C, 1, 2 and 4. Option D, 1, 3 and 4. See, this question is a perfect example to demonstrate elimination technique. We have given four statements. Take the third statement. There are 92 PVTGs officially notified in the country so far. Anyone who has studied the basic information regarding PVTG will know that India has officially only 75 PVTGs but they are given 92 PVTGs. So this statement should be incorrect. Third statement is wrong. So if we eliminate third statement from the option, option A is gone, option B is gone, and option D is also gone. So the correct answer is C, 1, 2, and 4. So just by knowing some basic information regarding PVTG, we were able to answer this question correctly. That is the beauty of elimination technique. Anyways, let us assess the other statements also. The first statement, PVTGs reside in 18 states and one union territory. This statement is correct. Currently, PVTGs are in 18 states and only one union territory, which is Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Second statement, a stagnant or declining population is one of the criteria for determining PVTG status. This statement is also correct. And as we have already discussed, third statement is incorrect. We have only 75 PVTGs. Fourth statement, Irular and Kondaredi tribes are included in the list of PVTGs. This statement is also correct. So the answer is option C, 1, 2 and 4. Now let us take up the second question. See, the second question was also asked in prelims 2019. It is from Polity. Under which schedule of the constitution of India can the transfer of tribal land to private parties for mining be declared null and void? Option A, third schedule. Option B, fifth schedule. Option C, ninth schedule. Option D, 12th schedule. See, schedules are important topic in polity. In the past 5-6 years, UPSC has almost asked 3-4 to four questions from schedules. So when you are studying polity, give high priority to schedules topic. Now let us assess the options. The first option, third schedule. See, the third schedule of Indian constitution deals with forms of oaths or affirmations. So this option is wrong. Now let us take up the C option, 9th schedule. See, 9th schedule contains the list of central and state laws which cannot be challenged in courts. This option is also wrong. Now let us take the D option, 12th schedule. 12th schedule of the Indian constitution deals with powers, authority and responsibilities of municipalities. So this option is also wrong. The correct answer is option B, 5th schedule. The 5th schedule of the constitution deals with the administration and control of schedule areas as well as scheduled tribes. So the fifth schedule of the constitution also deals with transfer of tribal lands. So the correct answer is option B, fifth schedule. Now let us move on to the third question. See the third question which we are going to discuss was asked in prelims 2013. This question is from culture. Some Buddhist rocket caves are called Chaityas while others are called Vyaras. What is the difference between the two? See Buddhism is an important topic in culture. Almost every year one question is asked from Buddhism in prelims. So this is a high priority area. When you are studying culture, give high priority to Buddhism. Now let us see the options. Option A, Vihara is a place of worship while Chaitya is a dwelling place of the monks. Option B, Chaitya is a place of worship while Vihara is the dwelling place of the monks. Option C, Chaitya is a stupa at the far end of the cave while Vihara is the all axial to it. Option D, there is no material difference between the two. 
So the correct answer is option B. See, Chaitya is a meeting or assembly chamber, which is often used for the purpose of prayer. So Chaitya is a place of worship. Whereas Viharas are the shelter accommodations of the monks during the rainy season. So it is the dwelling place of the monks. The correct answer is option B. Chaitya is a place of worship, while Vihara is the dwelling place of the monks. So we have discussed three past prelims question. Practice lot of prelims question. It will improve your accuracy. It will boost your score. We have approximately 77 days for this year prelims. Make maximum use of it. Now let us move on to the article discussion. Now let us begin the article discussion with the positive news. Now look at this sports article. See yesterday, Meera by Chanu has won a silver in the weightlifting category of the Olympic Games. This is a great news. It has made us all feel proud to be an Indian. And let us hope we win many more medals in the ongoing Tokyo Olympics. In this regard, let us discuss some important facts regarding Olympics and India's participation in Olympics. The syllabus relevant to this article is displayed on the screen. Interested aspirants can go through it. First, what is Olympics? Let us discuss about Olympics in brief. See, Olympic Games is an international multi-sport event which is held once in four years. They are held both in summer as well as winter. But remember, the summer and winter games are held alternatively every two years. So if summer Olympics is in 2020, then the winter Olympics will be in 2022. And the next summer Olympics will be in 2024 and next winter Olympics will be in 2026. See, each edition of the Olympics is hosted by a different host. And currently, Tokyo City of Japan is hosting the Summer Olympics of 2020. It is important to note that cities usually host Olympics. So it is called uh, Tokyo Olympics, Sydney Olympics, Beijing Olympics. It is not usually denoted by the country. Cities host the Olympics. So these are the basic points regarding Olympics. Now let us discuss about the important topic. India's participation in Olympics. See, India made its debut in the Olympics during the 1900 Paris Olympics. So in 1900 Paris Olympics, a sprinter named Norman Pritchard, he became the first Indian to take part in Olympics. He ran in five athletic events and won India's first ever medal. This was a silver medal. Now when you are talking about the gold medal, India won its first gold in 1928 Amsterdam Olympics. It was won by our prestigious Indian hockey's men team. But these are the victories of British India, not independent India. Our important victory came in 1948 London Olympics. It was during this Olympics, Indian hockey team won its first gold as independent India. This moment was an important watershed moment in independent India's sports history. So far, Indian hockey team has won 8 goals in Olympics. This is why Indian athletes are best known at the Olympics for their performance in hockey. Now look at this table. This table displays the sport and the medals won in that sport. And we can see maximum number of medals is won by hockey. So far we have won 11 medals, 8 gold, 1 silver and 2 bronze. Interested aspirants can go through this table. See India won 8 gold medals in hockey. But apart from hockey we didn't win gold medals. We were struggling to win gold medals. This thirst for gold medal was finally satisfied by shooter Abhinav Bindra. Abhinav Bindra won gold in the men's 10 meter air rifle category at the 2008 games in Beijing. So this was India's win in gold apart from hockey. Then when we take tennis, Leander Pears won the bronze medal in men's single category at the 1996 games in Atlanta. Atlanta is in United States of America. So in 1996 games in Atlanta, Leander Pace won the bronze medal. See the last decade has proven to be the best for India. In the last decade, India has won totally 8 medals in 2012 and 2016 Olympics. India's first Olympic medal in badminton was won by Saina Nehwal. She won a bronze in women's singles at London 2012 Olympics. Following her footsteps, P.V. Sindhu also won silver in the women's single category in 2016 Olympics. Have a look at this table. It displays the year and the number of medals won in that year. Interested aspirants can go through it. So we can see in 2016 and 2012, we won a total of 8 medals. We are on the rise. And let us hope we will win many more medals in ongoing Tokyo Olympics.
Now coming to the present times, that is 2020 Tokyo Olympics. See, in this 2020 game, India has opened its account by winning silver in the weightlifting category. What is weightlifting? See, weightlifting is a beautiful sport. The aim of this sport is very simple. It is to lift more weight than anyone else. The apparatus used in this sport is a barbell. A barbell is a long rod with weights attached to its ends. Barbell is represented in this figure. We can see the long rod and the weight attached to its ends. See, in weightlifting competition, athletes are grouped by body weights and based on two lifting techniques. What are the two lifting techniques? They are the snatch technique and clean and jerk technique. In snatch technique, the bar is lifted from the floor to above the head in one moment. There is no interruption. On the other hand, clean and jerk technique is a two-stage action. First, the bar is brought to the chest, then it is jerked over the head. So, we can say it has two stages. So in a weightlifting competition, athletes compete by performing each of these lifts three times. For example, yesterday Mirabai Chanu lifted snatch technique three times and lifted clean jerk technique three times. The highest weight from clean jerk technique and the highest weight from snatch technique is finally added. And the athlete who has the highest weight will be the winner. For example, yesterday Mirabai lifted 87 kgs in snatch technique. She also lifted 115 kg in clean and jerk segment. So in total she lifted 202 kg and she came second place in the 49 kg category. 49 kg category is the weight of the athlete. As we have already discussed in weightlifting athletes are grouped by body weights. So she represented India in 49 kg category and she totally lifted 202 kg. She came second and won silver medal. The first place was won by China. The Chinese athlete lifted 212 kg in total. That is 10 kg more than India. So China came in the first place and India came in the second place. See, this is not the first time India is winning a medal in weightlifting category. Karnam Maleshwari, almost everyone knows her name. She was the first legendary weightlifter to win a medal in women's weightlifting category. Karnam Maleshwari won bronze at Sydney 2000 Olympics. This was the year when women's events were first included in the weightlifting sport. And Karnam Maleshwari came third and won bronze medal for our country. She is a legendary athlete. Now everyone has a question. Who was the first individual Olympic medalist from independent India? That is after 1947. It was a wrestler named K.D. Jadav. K.D. Jadav won bronze medal at 1952 Helsinki Olympics. He was the first individual Olympic medalist from independent India. See, these kind of trivias are very important. See, there are many athletes like Mary Kom, Saki Malik, who have raised India's stature in the international arena of Olympics. We have discussed only the prominent wins. There are many athletes who have won medals in Olympics for India. So far, India has won 28 medals in Olympics. Hope this trivia helped you to understand India's participation in Olympics. With this, we have come to the end of this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about uh, Olympics. We saw about India's participation in Olympics. And we also discussed about Meera Bhai Chanu win. Now, let us move on to the next article. Now, look at this news article. This news article is regarding a speech given by a Prime Minister. See, recently at the International Buddhist Confederation, our Prime Minister highlighted the relevance of Lord Buddha's teaching in the current scenario. So, in this context, let us discuss some interesting facts about Buddhism. See, Buddhism is an important topic in prelims. When you take the last five or six year question paper, you can see at least one question from Buddhism. So, give high priority to Buddhism when you are studying culture. Now coming back to the discussion. See, when we are discussing Buddhism, first we have to discuss the three jewels of Buddhism. What are the three jewels of Buddhism? The first jewel is Buddha or the teacher. The second jewel is Dharma. Dharma means teaching. And the third jewel is Sangha. Sangha means community. So these are the three jewels of Buddhism. See, when we are talking about teachings of Buddhism, four noble truths hold a special place. What are these four noble truths? 
द ट्रूथ ऑफ सफरिंग और मिसरी इट इज ऑल्सो कॉल्ड एस दुक्का ट्रूथ ऑफ द ऑरिजिन ऑफ दिस सफरिंग समुदाय ट्रूथ ऑफ द सेशन ऑफ सफरिंग निरोधा ट्रूथ ऑफ द पाथ टू द सेशन ऑफ सफरिंग मग्गा सो दीस आर द फोर नोबल ट्रूथ ऑफ बुद्धिज्म सी डोंट मेमोराइज दीज टर्म्स जस्ट कीप ऑन रिवाइजिंग इट यू विल रिकलेक्ट दीज टर्म्स इन द एग्जाम सो कीप ऑन रिवाइजिंग इट यू विल रिटेन दीज टर्म्स डोंट राइट टू ब्लाइंडली मेमोराइज इट सो सो फार वी सॉब अबाउट थ्री ज्वेल्स ऑफ बुद्धिज्म एंड फोर नोबल ट्रूथ्स ऑफ बुद्धिज्म नाउ लेट इस डिस्कस अबाउट द एट फोल्ड पाथ ऑफ बुद्धिज्म इट इज ऑल्सो कॉल्ड एस मिडल वे सी द एट फोल्ड पाथ आर अ सेट ऑफ प्रिंसिपल दीज प्रिंसिपल इंक्लूड राइट अंडरस्टैंडिंग राइट रिसॉल्व राइट स्पीच राइट एक्शन राइट लिविंग राइट एफर्ट्स राइट थॉट एंड राइट सेल्फ कॉन्सेंट्रेशन सो दीज आर द एट फोल्ड पाथ ऑफ बुद्धिज्म You can use these points as value addition in your ethics answer. When you are taking ethical stand in your ethics answer, you can support your stand with these kind of information. You can say that Buddhism also promotes these ideology, and you can give some of these principles. That is how you differentiate your answer. Now coming back to Buddhism, see mudras form an important aspect of Buddhism. These mudras represent different events in Buddha's life. Now look at this image for the understanding of mudra. The first mudra is Dharma Chakra Mudra. It means wheel of Dharma. See, we all know that Buddha attained enlightenment in Sarnath. So after the enlightenment, he gave sermon to his companions. Sermon means a religious teaching. He gave a religious teaching to his companions. This event is represented by Dharma Chakra Mudra. Now let us move on to the second mudra, Bhumi Sparsha, or touching the earth. Bhumi means earth. This mudra. symbolizes buddha's enlightenment under the bodhi tree this mudra is represented in this figure we can see he is touching the earth or he is pointing to the earth and this mudra represents the event of enlightenment under the bodhi tree so far we saw two mudras now let us move on to varada mudra this mudra symbolizes charity compassion and boon granting boon granting means wish giving boon mean wishes See this mudra is represented in this figure as we can see from the figure it is almost like giving a wish wish granting someone is requesting something and buddha is giving a wish or buddha is granting a wish so this is varada mudra now let us move on to dhyana mudra see dhyana mudra has lot of multiple meanings many have interpreted this mudra in different ways but many have accepted that this mudra is the identification with the mystic fire that consumes all impurities so remember dhyana mudra is related to mystic fire these are the keywords this mudra also represents the three jewels of buddhism see we have already discussed the three jewels of buddhism buddha the teacher dharma the teaching and sangha the community so this mudra represents the three jewels of buddhism so so far we have seen about dharma chakra mudra bhumi parsha mudra varada mudra dhyana mudra finally let us see about abhaya mudra abhaya mudra symbolizes protection peace and dispelling of fear abhaya mudra is represented in this figure so with this we have come to the end of this discussion in this discussion we saw about three jewels of buddhism four noble truths of buddhism eight fold path of buddhism and important mudras of buddhism now let us move on to the next discussion Now look at this news article. This news article is regarding a monument called Hagia Sophia. See, Hagia Sophia is a museum in Turkey. But recently, the Turkish government has converted this museum into a mosque. So UNESCO had expressed its concern regarding this conversion. In return, Turkey has called UNESCO's concern as biased. This is the gist of this article. So in this segment, we'll be looking into Hagia Sophia See Hagia Sophia is also called as Hagia Sophia It is a unique monument of the world Its architecture is magnificent its functionality is exceptional So we can say it is one of the important monuments of the world See Hagia Sophia principally belonged to the Byzantine era It was later improvised in Christian period and it was later improvised during Ottoman era as well So we can say this monument is a synthesis between east and west It is a synthesis of Christianity as well as Islam. That is the beauty of this monument. It is a confluence of culture. Look at this picture. How magnificent it is. We have seen this monument many times in our Hollywood as well as Bollywood movies. Now let us discuss the origin of this monument. 
See, Hagia Sophia was initially built as a church. It was built during the reign of Constantius I or Constantius I. So it was built in the period between 324 to 337 AD. And as we have already discussed, it was built as a church, a Christian place of worship. See, Hagia Sophia was a Christian place of worship for 916 years since its construction. For almost 1000 years, this monument was a church. During its initial phase of construction, it was built as a Christian church with a wooden roof. This was burned down during a revolt. So this church was built for the second time again in 415 AD. And during the second phase of construction, many marble and colorful stones were brought to Istanbul from various ancient cities. Many mosaics were also incorporated into the architecture. These mosaics were gold glided with geometrical and floral designs. They also had the images of Jesus Christ, Virgin Mary. So for nearly 916 years, this monument functioned as a church. But later it was conquered by Ottoman Sultan. The name of the Ottoman Sultan is Sultan Mehmed, the conqueror. He conquered Turkey and converted the church into a mosque. So next Hagia Sophia served as a mosque for nearly 481 years. For, so for nearly 1000 years it was a church and nearly 500 years it was a mosque. So we can see the confluence of Christianity as well as Islam. See when Hagia Sophia was a mosque, Turkish architects made various changes to it. They included Turkish poetry, they included Turkish pottery, they included the art of calligraphy. See we have studied about calligraphy in Mughal era. The Mughals were great patterns of calligraphy. So similar to Mughals, the Turks also incorporated calligraphy to Hagia Sophia when it functioned as a mosque. We can also see the tombs of several Ottoman Sultans in Hagia Sophia. The Ottoman tradition and culture were incorporated into Hagia Sophia during this reign. It is also important to know that minarets were also erected in the premises during this period. When it functioned as a church, there were no minarets. See, minarets are a great example of Persian architecture. So it was added during the Ottoman tradition. To an idea about minarets, look at this picture. You can see that pillars, right? Pillar-like structures surrounding the monument. They are called as minarets. They are an important part of Islamic architecture. Even our Taj Mahal has many minarets. These minarets are always attached to the mosque. They also have open balconies. They add beauty and magnificence to the premises. This is the reason why many of the mosques incorporate minarets. And when Hagia Sophia functioned as a mosque, and when Hagia Sophia functioned as a mosque, minarets were incorporated into its architecture. See, we can see it functioned as a church. It functioned as a mosque. So there was a constant debate whether it should be church or a mosque. Many people supported Hagia Sophia to be a mosque. Many people supported Hagia Sophia to be a church. The debate was constantly going on. See, later Turkey became a secular country. It became a secular country under uh, Mustafa Kemal. So during his period, Hagia Sophia was converted into a museum. It was done by Mustafa Kemal. This conversion of museum put an end to the mosque versus church debate. And Hagia Sophia was opened as a museum in 1935. So first it functioned as a church, then it functioned as a mosque, and finally it functioned as a museum. But now Turkey has converted it back to mosque. This has again triggered the debate. And recently UNESCO has raised concern regarding the conversion. So these are the important points regarding Hagia Sophia. See this monument is a beautiful monument. It has been under the influence of Christianity, it has been under the influence of Islam. So we can see the confluence of culture. We can see both Christian as well as Islam tradition in this monument. This is also part of the historic areas of Istanbul. Istanbul is the capital of Turkey. So Hagia Sophia is a part of the historic areas of Istanbul. See the historic areas of Istanbul is included in UNESCO World Heritage List. So we can say Hagia Sophia is a part of World Heritage List. It has to be protected at all cost. With this we have come to the end of the discussion. In this discussion we saw about Hagia Sophia, its initial role as a church, its next role as a mosque, its role as a museum and the church versus mosque debate. Now let us move on to the next discussion. Now look at this article. See recently France has made it mandatory for healthcare workers to get vaccinated. If a healthcare worker is unvaccinated in France, he or she will not receive salary and will not be allowed to work. Similar to France, Greece and Italy have also made vaccination mandatory for healthcare workers. So we can see compulsory vaccination is promoted by many countries. So in this backdrop, this article has been written. 
In this discussion, we'll discuss this article. We'll discuss the important pros and cons regarding compulsory vaccination, and we'll also discuss whether compulsory vaccination is practically possible in India. The syllabus covered by this article is highlighted below for your reference. See, vaccination is the most widely suggested measure to break the virus chain. We all know this. This is because vaccination reduces the chances of transmission of virus. So this is why many countries are promoting compulsory vaccination of healthcare workers. See, healthcare workers are frontline workers, so they need maximum protection. They are exposed to virus on a daily basis. They can also act as asymptomatic carriers, since they are frontline workers. So this is why many countries are promoting compulsory vaccination of healthcare workers. But there is another problem too. See, from July 21st, France has announced that it will deny unvaccinated people entry into certain public places. For example, unvaccinated people will be denied entry into theaters, sports venues, festivals, cafes, bars, restaurants, shopping mall, and even long-distance trains. If unvaccinated people want access to these public places, they should show a negative test result. Otherwise, they won't be allowed entry. These are the new rules in France. These rules have created great uproar in France. It has caused a lot of protest. Many people in France believe that the country is promoting compulsory vaccination. They feel the compulsory vaccination is an infringement on their basic human rights. So let us discuss about compulsory vaccination. See, compulsory vaccination never involves coercive acts. To put it in simple words, compulsory vaccination does not demand people to vaccinate against their will. This is because vaccines are usually given wide exemptions on religious, social, and philosophical grounds. So even in France, the government is not forcing the people to get vaccine. It is not forcing the people to get vaccine against their will. But rather, France is creating a situation where vaccination is required. Let me explain this with an example. See, if a person doesn't believe in vaccine, France government won't force them to get vaccinated. He or she can stay at home without getting vaccinated. But if the same person want to access public places, he or she should get vaccinated, or they should show a negative test result. So we can see France is nudging the citizens to get the vaccinated. It is not forcing them. The final choice is with the individual whether to get vaccinated or not. But there is another problem. France has said it won't pay salary for unvaccinated healthcare worker. This is a issue. See, there is a difference between denying entry to a venue and denying a person their salary. This is because when we deny a person a salary, it has the potential to impact their economic and social well-being. It can also wide implications beyond the individual because many family members rely on the salary of their breadwinner. So we cannot deny salary of an individual just because he or she is unvaccinated. These measures are coercive and will put the individual at a disadvantage. See, getting vaccinated is an individual choice. We cannot force a person to get vaccinated. It is against human rights. So it is better to educate the people. It is better to have strong social mobilization strategies. We can empower people. We can make them aware of benefits of vaccination. So these strategies will help us to get people vaccinated, rather than having coercive measures, rather than forcing them. Forcing an individual to get vaccination against their will is unethical. It can have wide implications. So it is better to go for proactive measures rather than coercive measures. And when we are talking about healthcare workers, they have many alternative ways to protect themselves. For example, they have PPE kit. They can use mask, face shield. and many other protective gears are available for them so by using this alternative protection they can protect themselves as well as the patients so there is no need to force the unvaccinated healthcare workers in france see france policy of compulsory vaccination may seem like a success this is because within 2 days around 2.2 million people signed up to get vaccinated so from outsider perspective This policy of compulsory vaccination may seem like a success, but that is not the case. It has also created a lot of fear and apprehensions in the society. It has created a lot of protest in France. It can also lead to denial of access to key services and social opportunities, especially to the vulnerable groups. So governments have to think before implementing the policy of 
compulsory vaccination. Now let us discuss this concept in Indian context. Whether compulsory vaccination is required in India, whether it will work in India. See, according to India's health ministry, nearly 80% of healthcare workers and 90% of frontline workers are already vaccinated in India. So the author of this article feels that making vaccination compulsory for healthcare workers is not required since most of them are vaccinated. Also, India is facing shortage of vaccines. So by making vaccination compulsory, we will further aggravate the shortage of vaccines. It can also lead to fake vaccination certificate scams. Many people without getting vaccinated will get fake vaccination certificates. This will create a huge problem. So the author of the article feels that compulsory vaccination will not work in India and it is also not required in India. He feels that compulsory vaccination will only undermine the public support. It will be counterproductive and it will create new problems in our society. Many past evidences support this claim. Whenever we have made something compulsory, it had become counterproductive to our society. So instead of forcing people to get vaccinated, we should inform and empower people and we should also respect individual's choice. See, before making any intervention compulsory, we have to check whether that intervention follows few basic principles. For example, if we are going to make vaccination compulsory, we have to check whether the compulsory vaccination policy respects these principles. What are these principles? First, the benefit of such an intervention should be scientifically supported. So this is the first principle. Second principle, the vaccines should be easily available and should be accessible to every eligible citizen. This is the second principle. And third principle, there should be reasonable exemptions. So instead of making any intervention compulsory, we should always give some exemptions. So when we take India, we are currently facing vaccine shortages. Demand is outstripping our supply. So we can see we are not adhering to these principles. What is the second principle? Vaccine should be easily available and accessible to every eligible citizen. So with the current vaccine shortage, we cannot respect this principle. So compulsory vaccination is not a viable option for India. So these are the important points highlighted in this article. See, in this article, we discuss about compulsory vaccination policy of France, the pros and cons of such compulsory vaccination policy. And finally, we discuss whether compulsory vaccination will work in India. Now, let us move on to the next discussion. Now, let us take up this news article. See, according to WHO, 15% of the world's population have mental issues. And when we take India, 74% of senior citizens have stress. And also 88% of Indians have reported anxiety. See, this is a big issue. Right now, India is a young country. But by 2050, number of senior citizens in India will be around 20% of our population. So treating elderly issues like dementia, Alzheimer will be very challenging. This is what the article is trying to convey. So in that context, let us discuss about dementia, Alzheimer, its diagnosis and treatment. The syllabus relevant to this article is displayed on the screen. Interested aspirants can go through it. First, what is Alzheimer? See, Alzheimer's disease is a brain disorder that slowly destroys memory and thinking skills. So a person with Alzheimer slowly loses his memory and thinking skills. Eventually, you will lose his ability to carry out even the simplest task. It is a very cruel disease and it is usually found in elderly patients. We have discussed about Alzheimer. Then what is dementia? See, dementia is a general term for a collection of symptoms. What are these collection of symptoms? Loss of memory, loss of language, loss of problem solving abilities, loss of thinking abilities. So these collection of symptoms are generally called as dementia. Dementia is generally found in Alzheimer patients in the later stages. Why do a person develop dementia? See, we all know neural tissues are present in our brain. These neural tissues are important for thinking and memory abilities. So with time, with aging, protein deposits in the neural tissue. So this deposition of protein will lead to gradual deterioration of brain functions. And the person will finally develop dementia. That person will lose his memory and thinking abilities. And dementia is generally found in the later stages of Alzheimer patients. See, Alzheimer is a cruel disease. It affects quality of life. It generally 
increases the medical bills many times it also imposes a great strain on the next generation this is because elderly patients with alzheimer they will be incapable to perform even simple functions so younger generation should take care of them this will affect the functioning of the younger generation it will also increase the cost of medical expenses so it is important that we diagnose alzheimer in the early stages itself how can a disease be diagnosed in early stages this question rises in our mind see diseases are usually diagnosed in early stages through a concept called biomarkers this is the key one biomarker what are these biomarkers see biomarkers are biological parameters which indicates a underlying medical condition for example imagine a person with diabetes the biomarker for diabetes is insulin level so when we measure the insulin level we know whether that person has diabetes so in the case of diabetes insulin level acts as biomarker another example let us take anemia in anemia we can diagnose anemia with hemoglobin so hemoglobin acts as biomarker for anemia another example is hemoglobin hemoglobin acts as a biomarker for serological study see in serological study we assess whether a person has been exposed to covid so by measuring the hemoglobin level in that person we can assess whether that person has been exposed to covid so in serological study immunoglobulin acts as a biomarker so with this biomarker we can diagnose the disease in the early stages it plays a crucial role in medical field so the author of the article feels that we should diagnose dementia and alzheimer using some biomarker this will help in the early diagnosis of this disease it will also help us to slow down the progress of the disease but the biomarker for alzheimer is not well developed the treatment of the disease is also not well researched so this is a huge problem then what is the way forward see according to the author of this article our traditional medicines and plant sources might have answers for alzheimer's to understand this solution first we should understand about a study this study was done by an institute called wiesman institute this institute is located in israel see according to this study a compound called beta cytosterol or bss this compound reduces anxiety and it can be used in treatment of alzheimer the beauty of this compound is it is naturally found in many of our plant sources this compound bss is also found in many of our traditional indian medicine so the author of the article feels that by exploring our traditional indian medicine we can find the cure for this cruel disease this will help us to reduce the burden of alzheimer disease on the old age population so this is the way forward so you can use this point as solution in your main answer traditional medicines and the compound called bss see india has a rich history of traditional medicine india has to fully explore this traditional medicine so that we can better diagnose diseases and we can better treat the problems state government central government and private players should come together to achieve this goal this will be highly beneficial to our health sector so these are the important points stressed in this article with this we have come to the end of the discussion in this discussion we saw about alzheimer disease we saw about dementia we saw about biomarkers and we also discussed about traditional medicine and a compound called bss bss stands for beta cytosterol now let us move on to the next discussion practice prelims question first question consider the following statements with reference to india's performance in the olympics first statement india has won gold medal only in hockey second statement india won maximum number of medals so far in the 2012 london olympics which of the statements given above are correct a one only b two only c both one and two d neither one nor two see first statement is incorrect india has won gold in hockey as well as india has won gold in shooting as you can see in the table india has won eight gold medals in hockey and india has won one gold medal in shooting so first statement is incorrect moving on to the second statement second statement is correct see so far india has won maximum number of medals in 2012 london olympics the number of medals is 6 so this statement is correct and let us hope we'll cross this number in 2020 tokyo olympics the correct answer is option b two only only the second statement is correct now let us move on to the second question consider the following pairs mudra symbol first mudra dharma chakra mudra first sermon second bhumi parsha mystic fire three varada mudra enlightenment which of the given pairs are correctly matched See the correct answer is option A one only only dharma chakra mudra is correctly matched dharma chakra mudra symbolizes first sermon 
whereas bhumi parsha mudra symbolizes enlightenment not mystic fire and similarly varada mudra symbolizes charity compassion and boon granting not enlightenment so the second and third pair are incorrectly matched only the first pair is correctly matched so the answer is option a one only mains practice questions are displayed here you can write your answer and post in the comment section below with this we have come to the end of the news analysis if you like the video click like comment and subscribe thank you